Welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. With Coach Jonathan Lee, I probably sound very different than normal. We're not in the studio. We're actually at Strava HQ. And round of applause for everybody here. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Pretty awesome to have us here. Uh, for everybody that's listening to this, I'm sure you all use Strava, so no need to introduce there. But my special guest, on the other hand, uh, uh, many of you also know who he is, Kelly Sturette. So, Kelly, can you, uh, first of all, you're an author, a doctor, physio, uh, expert on mobility, an elite athlete, biker, mountain biker. You actually just did eight, no, six day tour down in Moab. Yeah, the Hey Duke Trail. Amazing. Uh, mountain biking. Right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Pretty Probably awesome. Can, we'll hang that in quotation. <laughs> <laughs> but can you give people, and we're, we're going to talk about mobility, injury prevention, that sort of stuff today. But can you give people a quick background on your history with cyclists? Because I bet a lot of people come across your content like Becoming Supple Leopard, Desk Bound, or the different videos that you do, which are awesome, by the way. We recommended them many times on the podcast, but they may not know of your background with cycling. So how did you get involved with cyclists? What's your history there? If we go way back, when I was a younger man, I grew up in southern Germany, Bavaria, and I had a mountain bike. And everyone rode, and it was not a big deal to put in – 50k on the weekend is like a, in the sixth grader we'd ride to austria buy chocolate and and biking was just a thing that everyone did and it was really the gateway to freedom and it was and it was really the the nascent evolution early stump jumpers peugeot had a few things right everything is rigid steel frames um and then i went to boulder for for college and there's some cyclists around boulder you know so just a few um biking for me you know i don't know what about but it's always been sort of a through narrative of, of a way that we trained saw the world and used for our sports so it's a great way to sort of you know become more effective at our sports fast forward a little bit and uh it turns out that we have a lot of friends so my wife is a three-time world champion and she happened to be a whitewater paddler on a team with this woman named rebecca rush <laughs> may have heard of her so rebecca and my wife are best friends and i met rebecca way back in 2000 and then started working with her as an adventure racer and then that was even before and she was a terrible cyclist by her own admission right <laughs> but she could out suffer everyone and that was before she even became world champion in the 24-hour endurance stuff so i'd say my first really glimpse of professional cycling was through rebecca and watching and how, and it really was just sort of an emergent phenomenon around nutrition. I remember at a, a, a nutrition talk in Boulder, I think Dave Scott came, you know, and, and uh, it was all just, you know, he was talking about riding Kona with a, a bag full of dates or, you know, or like <laughs> figs and bananas and just, you know, it was such an emergent time. Then, you know, a few years later, Alan Lim, um, Scratch Labs reached out and was like, hey, I, I'd like you to work with some of our cyclists. And we immediately hit it off because, as you said, the goal of the podcast, the goal of, of TR is to make people faster. And somehow in the conversation around human performance and injury prevention, it's easy to forget that the thing that matters the most is wattage and power. That's it. That's, the, that's, the, that's, our, that's our small God. Yeah, exactly. right? small G. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, fat, now here we are, and I've, I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of really fantastic cyclists and uh, really kind of get close to the nitty gritty. So, you know, I think early on, it's, you have this real, this uh, idealistic view of what's possible. And then as you become a little bit older, more mature, more experienced, you make that in with, with uh, what's really, you know, gonna, going to happen. Yep. And I think I was interested, my, my doctoral work was originally looking at barriers to adherence, what keeps people from doing the behaviors they think they need to do. And now here we are being able to track all this information, and we're really seeing this intersection of people having access to elite, high-quality training to be able to, I mean, Strava is a verb, you know, yeah, seriously. that <laughs> my friends are obsessed with, you know, like my, 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 my machine died and, you know, they, they're, they're watch died in the desert this weekend they were going to be upload their strava like they can't yeah, even, they, they, they can't even prove they exist as humans just stop yeah that's yeah, right like, you know, what, do, what do i do now <laughs> so um here we are and what's really amazing is i we've always felt like if we could take formula one sport and and divine out what we think are first principles then that really gave us an opportunity to help those of us who are just f-250s and camrys right like we're and in fact we, we, we like to believe is that that's why the high, highest level of sport exists. Yeah. It's, a, it's in the best laboratory where we can really understand what's going on. 
and then take those best practices out. And now, because of the data and of our experience and sort of the, the consilience of all of these um, really interesting fields, I think we're really starting to say, hey, here are our first principles that are really sound robust. Yeah. And now everyone has access to, I mean, the lie that we've told everyone is you can be an elite athlete. And uh, because you can train like one Relatively and track elite. everything. That's right. So super elite for me. <laughs> I mean, I'm the elitist <laughs> man in my house as I'm the only man in my house. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and, and first of all, thank you to a friend of the podcast, a mutual friend of ours, Levi Leifheimer, one of the cyclists you worked with, because he was actually the one that introduced us and made this happen. So thank you, Levi. Um, but you've worked with, I mean, a full spectrum of athletes. And, and a lot of people probably know you specifically on like the mobility side of things. And the first thing I want to start off with is, in simple terms, can you define the difference between mobility and flexibility? Sure. Flexibility describes the properties of a rubber hose. Got it. Perfect. Mobility describes how human beings move. And what we should do is, because uh, when we started our uh, mobility project, you know, it was, we, we just tried to get people to level up because what we saw is that people were killing themselves working hard, but they weren't necessarily you know, doing the things to recover, to regenerate, to, to improve position and mechanics, you know, and what we do is we get injured and then we'd go, you know, throw the shotgun at it, right? And you would go talk to the doctor and get an ART and massage and you do dry needling, whatever it takes so that you could go back and then those things went away, right? And you went and brack and broke yourself and hopefully you made it a little further on the next time. So I bet that sounds familiar to a lot of people in here, right? Just work harder. It's fine. It's totally <laughs> yeah. fine. Yeah, exactly. So here we are. And uh, what we realize is that, um, you know, when we, we use the word mobility specifically, and we really coined the term mobility, not for cell phones and, and wheelchair access, but uh, what we wanted people to understand was it was about range of motion and also the skill to express that range of motion. So it's not just, you know, I can move my joints through their all their physiologic range and do, do the things that every human being should be able to do for just base range of motion, but also that there's a skill component to this, to creating more stable, more functional Positions. And what's great about that is that we can say unequivocally, you can either ha you have all your hip flexion or not, right? Like, what's your name, sir? Charlie, of course. Stand back up. I'm going to so, describe this for people that are. So, Charlie's standing up, and of course, I'm picking on Charlie because, you know, we're friends now. <laughs> and uh, Charlie, I'm going to have you stand on your left leg and pick up your right knee and keep your buff left leg straight. You see, he's past 90, right? That's pretty amazing. Right? He's not breathing, which is a compensation that's really weird. <laughs> that's totally fine. I'm going to get super stable. <gasps> I'm an aerobic athlete, and I'm going to try to work this out. But notice that his, when he starts breathing, his leg dropped down, and he's missing only what? How much? What's normal hip range of motion for a person? 135 degrees? 120 degrees? <laughs> you got it. Keep he's twisting. Reaching. He's reaching. Stop breathing again. <laughs> Charlie, great job. Great job. Okay. Thanks, Charlie. So... What we haven't done for people is said, this is what you should be able to do. Yes. And now what we've done is said, well, we have a bike that we can fit you, right? And we'll keep going around these problems and say, say, instead of saying, this is what we think is baseline function for the human being, let's take care of that. Because when we, when we begin to do that, and then now we can start to cross things off our vampire of, of force production list. And that's really what this comes down to is, is, letting people be athletes in their imperfect, complex, psycho-emotional selves, comma, let's at least begin to make the baselines the baselines. So on the topic of mobility, we're gonna get, I'm gonna get into probably a terrible question on that in just a bit, so stay tuned, that'll be exciting. But right now, getting into one on flexibility, should cyclists focus on flexibility, or is that just a byproduct of working on proper mobility? Well, let's define that. So one of the problems with flexibility is it's nonspecific. Like, stretch your hamstrings, I'm like, I don't even know what that means. Like, I mean, should I stretch my hamstrings? Is that something that I want to stretch? So if I bend over and touch my toes, I certainly feel tension in my hamstrings. Is that stretching? I think the real question is sort of, you can think of this in two ways. Is one is, do I have access to my full physiology? And I should have access to that cold. I shouldn't have to activate my glutes and do some black magic ritual so that I can get on the bike. Yeah. Nor should it take me 45 minutes to feel good on the bike. So to the extent that if you have access to your full position, it doesn't take much to, to take care of that, right? Maybe some soft tissue work for DOMS and down regulation and some of the other things, but ultimately what we wanna do is establish, hey, here's what you should be able to do, especially as it relates to compensation on the bike. 
or just... compensation running, right? It is, it is common. And it's because, you know, these things are so egalitarian and so democratized that I can get into these shapes and generate freakish amounts of watts. I mean, go to any cycle club and just marvel at the fact that you can sit on a machine and grab a bike and your feet go here and you clip in and you die, you bleed through the eyes. <laughs> Meanwhile, because it's so high physiology and so low skill, it's difficult for us to understand where we're giving away force. And more importantly, we're giving away compensation. So compensation is the right language about saying, hey, when your knee is diving in or you're having to early round your back or you're cranking your neck back, like here's, here's a great example. Everyone who's sitting here, don't move. Don't change your position. Don't move. You're doing great. Take the biggest breath in you can. Everyone just took a breath right through their chest. Why? Because you're in a position where your diaphragm doesn't work very well. Why? Because your spine is not in a well-organized position. Now watch this. Get into the position where you can take the biggest breath you can. Go ahead. Why did y'all change shapes? I didn't say to change shapes. <laughs> I didn't say turn your pelvis into a different position. I didn't say put your shoulders back. I said get into a position where you can do what? Maintain your physiology, right? So now take the biggest breath in you can. Better say worse. So this is the only real conversation we can have that's worth merit, is that I put you in a position that re retains and maintains your function and your output. And I see that expressed through wattage. I see that expressed through sustained wattage. And so if I put you into a position where you can ventilate more effectively, I mean, why are we measuring your VO2 max in a crumpled down, you know, bent hose tube with carburetor choked off and right. I mean, you just, you know, this is a crappy position to breathe in. Right. Okay. And so what, what we really want to do and establish is that, Hey, it's difficult to say you will not get injured. I know that I can put you in cause injury is a complex beast, but I can say that, Hey, you should care about your position. And if the word that you want to use is flexibility or mobility or range of motion, I can be completely agnostic about that, but show me you have access to your physiology, and more importantly, that you have enough physiology to do your sport. So it would be nice if, Charlie, you do another test for us? Per stand up. <laughs> Great. Will you put your feet together for me? And squat all the way down. Oh, stop. He made a face. <laughs> like, I was like, can you do something that every human being should do? It's called taking a poop in the woods. <laughs> and you were like, oh, PR, I don't know, man. I'm not warmed up. I haven't, I'm have a coach. All right, can you squat all the way down and keep your heels on the ground? So you're going to have to come away from the chair, <laughs> cheater, and go all the way down. So check this out. That's rad, right? He, he, we could go to Thailand. You'd be a great travel partner. We could eat dinner, <laughs> right? That's full access to his hip range of motion, full access to his ankle range of motion, which means that I can start crossing power leaks and positions off the bike. And everyone should be able to do that. That's not, that's amazing. You're, you're, you're sort of like a unicorn in the cycling building. Everyone else want to take this challenge? No one else wants to take the challenge. <laughs> Everyone's like, thank you, Charlie. You're a sad. <laughs> so what we haven't done for people is said, here's what your body should be able to do. Now, what are the tools to get me there? And so when we see people doing exercises or drills to become better on the bike, so a pedaling drill, for example, yeah is a good, what we call skill transfer exercise. And I'm using a drill to make myself better at, at cycling. If I mobilize my hip or took care of my ankle, I'm actually, we call those position transfer exercises. And we have clear range of motion goals. And more importantly, what we try to do is help people understand, because it's a little bit of a moving target. You just flew back from Germany, you're stiff, you have a kid, right? You're, you're commuting to work, you're on big deadlines, you launch some big thing at your company. And, uh, you know, you can look a little bit rough. So how do I know when I start to compensate? Can't maintain breath, my knee starts to dive in, I get wobbles, my back hurts when I climb. And that's really the language of incomplete mechanics. So those are the signs that you should look for if you do need to do some work. Yeah, so we can, we can do this, two things. One is I can become enough of a skilled mover that I can begin to understand that, hey, something's not feeling right. Like, you know, I remember a long time ago with, with Levi, for example, and he's a good friend, so we can talk about this. He was like, my seat is, like, we've been playing with my, my time trial seat, up a millimeter, down a millimeter, up a millimeter, down a millimeter. It just doesn't feel right. Up a millimeter, I was like, really? Your butt doesn't compress, the chamois doesn't get wet, like, <laughs> one millimeter, is that the difference? Or is it your body, is it at such limits of its function because the tolerance is, because this is the, this is the game we're playing, the time, trial the time trial position that you don't have access to your physiology, so it feels like that one millimeter makes a difference. So what we're trying to do is give people options.
And right. we've all felt that too. Like when you get on the bike and you just, nothing feels right. It's almost like your bike fits changed. Fast forward 15 minutes and it's fine again, right? It's back to normal. Which is a really interesting conversation of like, I'm fitting you to what? Like, wh who are you when I fit you to your bike? Are you warmed up? Have you been riding for 45 minutes? Have you, have you mobilized your hips? I'm taking a snapshot of you today. And you're like, yeah, I got fit six years ago. This is who I am. It's like, really? <laughs> you know, my wife had a beautiful hand-built C-SIP that she did the death ride in, like, you know, before our first daughter. So it's like 14 years old. It's gorgeous. But she jumped on it for the Grand Fondo recently. And she was like, this isn't my bike. And I was like, oh, it's not your bike, is it? <laughs> like, what has happened between in the last 14 years, two kids, you know, some other thing. So things change a little bit we need to be able to be sensitive enough in our bodies off the machine to be able to understand what is normal and not normal. So a, a mobility practice is about, and look, cycling is pretty, we'll put it in the quotation marks, simple. And I, I, know, I know how sophisticated it is because I'm a rider. But in terms of the range of motion requirements and skill requirements, it's pretty simple. Yeah, I wanted to cover that because, I mean, a lot of people are like, oh, you're on a bike, you're just in a single plane. Like, like you basically sit and then your legs move just on the single plane, right? Moving up and down. So... Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, let's cover do, that. We, do we all agree that that's actually what's happening here? That's the assumption, right? That's the assumption. But look at the chirality of the leg. Look at the torsion set up to the system. So the way you're, I mean, if your femur connects to your pelvis through this, you have a rotator cuff in your hip, right? So everyone's heard of the rotator cuff of the shoulder. The hip has a rotator cuff too. It's six, six rotator cuff muscles. Everyone's heard of the piriformis, of course, right? But there's two gemelli, right? There's the obturators, the quadratus femoris. There's a whole lot of hip musculature and a huge capsule. So if you imagine if you took your, your fist and you put it in your shirt and you just tried to pull on it to make it tight, it would just bang around. If you added rotation to that system, all of a sudden you can see that you create stability in that hip. So one of the challenges in, in cycling is we're not really weight bearing but the system is set up to create this weight bearing phenomenon. So what we see a lot of times is how do I manage these really complex forces? And it, while the expression may be more linear, the actual forces to the system have huge rotational forces involved. And the question is, what do I need to do to make myself a better cyclist? And that's really the answer, right? And, and so now we can have the right question because understand that your physiology is very complex, even though you're choosing to express it in this very narrow way. So I guess getting into that, what sort of, uh, there are a lot of exercises, for example, that are like, you know, we're talking uh, rotational exercises and you can see them like on, on everything from becoming self a leopard in the book and everything else, but they're like really dynamic exercises. And a lot of cyclists I see just basically defaults like deadlift and squat. Right, and that's just basically what I do. If every cyclist in this room deadlifted to deadlift and squat, everyone would be a better cyclist, <laughs> for starters. Right. So, I think what we want to understand is, and it may be as useful as this to say that I'm using cycling to become a better person, a more fit athlete. Right. That means that I probably there's not a lot of good movement quality, movement density in the cycling. Right. right, And it, that's what's great about it. It's what makes it so democratized and allows me to take so many different bodies and shapes and ages and still give people this experience. We love cycling. We love watt bikes. We're, we, we are on board. I own, I don't know, 18 stationary bikes. Right? <laughs> right. So I'm, I'm on board. So, um, but what's interesting, I think, is, you know, is asking ourselves, what's the point? So if my sport is cycling, then all the things that I need to be doing or should just be to support cycling. And that's what we call sports specific training. So this doesn't mean I need to mimic cycling. It means that the only outcome and measurement of the quality of my training should be, do I get faster? Does it improve my wattage? Do I have less pain, right? That's the goal. That's a key point right there. Huge it's point. not that you just train by doing the same thing, but you just measure the improvement in that very sport. 100%. And what I think is so great about cycling or running is more complicated. We talk about since we're talking cycling is that I have this really agnostic raw data point, faster. Yes or no more wattage. Yes or no. And it, and that's brutal. I mean, I have to sometimes cover the watt meter so I don't break myself <laughs> yeah. psychoemotionally, right? But um, I think what's interesting is then we could step out of that and say, well, okay, what's the, what's the tear down from sports-specific training? Because that's, if I look at the, the athletes, you know, one of the reasons Alan Lim and I got along so famously early on is I was like, well, I was like, bring a watt meter or something, a power meter, so we can actually test the change we made. And he's like, what? 
I was like, well, why do you think we're doing that? Like the only expression of getting this heel working or improving this hip flexion is to express more power and we should see it immediately. Yeah. Right. And he was like, oh, we're going to be great friends. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what's nice about now is that we can step back and say, okay, well, what's sports preparation training? Sports preparation training means I do need to keep an eye on mechanics. I do need to keep an eye on energy systems and full physiology. So if I came out of a competitive cycling season, maybe what I'm moving into is sports preparation training, which is restoring my mechanics, which become degraded as soon as I become a specialist. And it's okay to specialize, but you have to understand that you can't say if you, all you do is cycling, that you are a great athlete, you're a great cycling athlete. If you can't put your arms over your head or take a breath, this is going to be a problem. So sports preparation means that I can still tweak myself to become a better cyclist, but in the sports specific training, I just start to drop things out a little bit, right? On the other side of that, I think what's confusing is we'll call GPP, general physical preparedness. And that smells like CrossFit. That smells like orange theory. So now I'm looking at energy systems and maybe more range of motion movements that people are trying to do, but it definitely is just about physiology, right? Like I went harder, one more kilo, and it's not about positional quality and skill. Sometimes it can be, and certainly GPP could be right into that sports preparation. But then you go on the other side and we call it fitnessing. And so cyclists are like, I need to cross train. Yeah. How can I kill myself cross training? And so they'll just go to Orange Theory and do something where they die, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, dude, four hours of Zumba will crush you people, <laughs> right? And you can't handle it. You know, that, that fitnessing is great, but does not necessarily – give me that observable, measurable, repeatable phenomenon, and more importantly, expression of better output. So to the extent that, you know, the real question is, what should I be doing? Well, if you don't have hip extension as an athlete, you, that means I'm not talking about extending your hip, but if you were standing, your knee came behind your midline, that's hip extension. If you don't have access to that hip extension, your joint doesn't work correctly. If you can't flex and extend your upper back, you're not going to be able to take a breath. So we need to be able to start to simplify the menu. And then we can add in things like, well, I swing kettlebells and I squat and I have to turn my feet out because my ankles are so stiff, right? Everyone can relate to that. Yep. Is that how you ride with your feet turned out? You can ride like that. But what's the problem with that? It's not a very efficient way to ride. So the question is, hey, am I just a physiology piece of meat? Who's trying to become better at cycling by just working harder, or am I trying to restore my positions and mechanics? And what I'll say for the average person is it's difficult sometimes to understand in real time what the body's doing on the bike, but it's way easy to understand when you do an air squat or a kettlebell swing or strict press what's happening with your body. So for the average, average cyclist who's obsessed with going faster, which we all are, or I am, you know, my, my local, you know, FTP is, you know, 25 minutes nose only to the top of a local climb, right? That's how I measure who I am as a, as a human being. <laughs> as we all do, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's going to be a good day, kids. <laughs> exactly. No, but, but ultimately what I should be doing is improving my mechanics, not just working harder. Yeah. And that means that I sometimes need a parallel diagnostic language. And that turns out to be movement, whatever that is, Pilates, yoga, CrossFit, you know, strength training, kettlebells, doesn't matter. We're agnostic. Are there specific like movements that you see to be generally effective for cyclists? Not like GPP sort of stuff. We're just talking about like when a cyclist comes to you and you're helping that cyclist and you're training them, are there general like, like consistent trends where they usually benefit from this exercise and this exercise? They really benefit from moving out of this little tiny plane. Imagine that. Right? <laughs> right? That's it. Like, you know, one of the things I, like I said, we, you mentioned, I just came off of like a 200 and, I think it was 240 miles of the Hey Duke. Kudos and I, look, I'm just a middle-aged guy who likes to ride his bike. And um, six days in a row, you know, and I was like, dude, I, my, nothing hurts. I got out unharmed. I crushed myself with my friends. I boosted sick stuff and, uh, for a middle-aged guy. And, um, <laughs> and I came out unharmed. And really that, for me, that was one of the goals. And so as we, set, as we move for that or, or – and that really should be all our goal, right? To maintain our love of cycling and not be, not be sort of sidelined by my low back hurting or my knees hurting. And the question is how much, or literally what's the minimum effective dose so I can maintain my positions. And so what you're seeing is that if you're at least out of the shape of cycling, what you don't need to do is just only close your hip, but you do need to practice creating rotation. You need to practice, you know, so if you just jumped into a Pilates class or yoga class, that's a great start. Right? Because at least you're going to have to get into these end range shapes and be able to breathe in those end range shapes. Then we can start to layer on some really foundational and basics around strength conditioning, which, which is, if anyone's listening to this, 
get a kettlebell. I can get you the Olympics with a kettlebell. You know what I mean? You, right. If you have one kettlebell in your house, we can almost hit all your movement guidelines, eccentric loading, breathing, shoulder stability, loading. You know, let's kettlebell first. Uh, let's talk about injury really quick here. So uh, I've had a lot of, a lot of people have had knee injuries in here. A lot of people that are listening to this podcast have had knee injuries. I've had one. I, I swear, I, I feel like I was crossing off every PT on oh. list, right? Going through the whole thing, going through dry needling, going through endless whatever else. Like, All of these practitioners suck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. It must not be me. It's someone else. It's, it's not me. I need to find the right person. Yes, right. obviously. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So what's you the most- need that blood magic that Mr. Miyagi did that, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the, I guess, what's the main, is there a main cause that you see like a main culprit for knee injuries for cyclists? Is it, is it hip well, let's, let's do this. Let's, de let's define injury first because I think this is really important because one of the things that's really exciting right now is because people have become so much more sophisticated about their bodies. They really are. I mean, people, I mean, people are off the goo. They're eating more whole foods. Their hydration is better. Sleep is better. I'm seeing a real change that you know, you know, people are drinking less even. You know, I'm not talking about a beer after your ride, but I'm talking about people are like, whoa, it really messes up my cardiac function for days and days. How do I know? I'm actually tracking it for the first time. So we're seeing people get serious on those things. So injury, if we define that, is cannot occupy my role in society. Like you're injured when you can't hold the baby or do the laundry and your wife is going to be so mad at you. That's injured right? And you're going to pay a price. Can't occupy my role at work, right? Can't do my sport if I'm a competitive athlete, or there's a bone sticking out of my leg, right? I'm clearly injured. Something's right. I have tissue damage. That's <laughs> obvious, right? So injury. How many people in this room would describe themselves as injured? Raise your hand. A couple of you. Okay. How many of you describe yourselves as having pain? Raise your hand if you have pain. So it's just twice the number. Okay, so what's interesting is does pain mean injury? No, it doesn't. In fact, what we're going to see is that that pain piece is what we have typically defined myself as injured. But if you had, those of you guys who raised your hand with pain, would you still ride? You're like, yeah, I try to pull it out of my cold, dead hands. Of course I'm going to ride. <laughs> There's enough ibuprofen and THC. Let's do this, <laughs> right? So what we're seeing is, that pain is a really common phenomenon and an experience of the athletic life. And, and we shouldn't back away from it or fear it, but I want to be really clear about what we define as injury and what we define as pain. And so pain is what we call an incident level problem, right? It, it's, a, it's a pain in the butt, right? My knee hurts when I ride, but once I get warmed up and take some, it's okay. I can still go out and crush my friends, right? But what we want to say then is, well, hey, what does that pain mean? And and now what we're finding, if we're talking about pain, well, let's start crossing things off a lift around the knee. So if you lay down on your stomach and I flexed your heel towards your butt, I want your heel to come roughly a fist from your top of your glutes. So if you have big glutes, you're lucky, right? But you're a cyclist, so you're unlucky. So here you go. So if you just flex that foot back, that's normal range of motion. That would be really hard to do without your hip pulling up. Well, no, it wouldn't be really hard to do if your hip pulled for, up. For average people, I for, for cyclists who are stuck flexed, stuck bent, for lack of a better word. And they can generate, you know, beat toasters at 700 watts, right? Like them, <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking like about. a German rider. Yeah. The German rider, German world champion. What you're seeing is potentially I have an inefficient system. So I have a system that's adapted to this strain and position. And now somehow, because I don't have access to my full physiology, my knee is hurting. So you certainly could have knee cancer. If you're concerned with knee cancer, let's cross off. Let's go talk to your doctor. But oftentimes it's not knee cancer. But what we can say is, hey, instead of changing your shoe, and getting a bike fit, and changing something, different stem, let's go ahead and make sure that your body fits the bike, not that the bike fits the body. So when we start to say, hey, look, look how stiff your system is. So not only did your leg stop at 90 degrees, like imagine this was your elbow. And I was bringing, so right now I'm flexing my elbow to my mouth, right? And my elbow suddenly stops at 90. And you were like, whoa. And I, start, I have to eat and flex my neck into a weird position and flex my wrist. I'm like, man, my neck is killing me. And you're like, dude, it's not your neck. I'm like, for sure, it's my neck. <laughs> right? And you're like, you're not, your elbow is stuck in a 90 degree angle. I'm like, well, that's not the problem because, you know, my knee, my elbow doesn't hurt. Yeah. But everyone can see that this is a problem, right? But why can't we see that this is a problem? 
So if my knee is stiff at 90, the compressive forces and shear and inefficiency at that knee joint, eventually the knee is raising its hand and being like, sister, you got to, mm -mm, we need something else going on here. So what, what we want to do then is, hey, not only do we have the raw, just dead range of motion, right, just on passive, but also it shouldn't be stiff. So if I grab your foot and it takes me like I'm pulling on it with a come along and I'm, ah, that's a really inefficient system. That's like driving your car with the handbrake on three or four clicks. And, and your engine is so big and so refined that you can crush me, but eventually that inefficiency is going to catch up with you in terms of lost wattage, lost days, or potentially pain. Yeah. And the thing is, a lot of us can get away with this inefficiency for decades, Yeah. right? We, we don't know, and then something happens. And the question is, what happened? Well, you got stressed, you flew on a red eye, you, you know, you got old, you know, something happened and your body became sensitized and couldn't deal with your crap anymore, even though you've only been running on, you know, three out of eight cylinders for a long time and you're still the world champion. Yeah. So what we try to do with our athletes is say, look, I don't care if, where you are in the world. And remember, I get to work with some of the best athletes in the world. And my job is to take those athletes and find out what their potential is right? Not their relative potential to everyone else. And what we do is we start to cross things off the list around their ability to maintain their shapes and positions. So if I said you can flex your hip in a squat, right? That makes sense. I'm squatting down, flexing my hip. I'm like, great. Can you do that with load? Can you do that when your heart rate is 200? Can you do that for 20 minutes when your heart rate is 200? Right? I can keep going. Can I do that when you're competing with your heart rate is 200, when you're expressing 600 watts? And I mean, so what you're ultimately seeing is, show me 600 watts for 20 minutes would be cool, wouldn't it? <laughs> Fantastic. I have dreams. <laughs> it's called an e-bike. <laughs> so the question is, the more I'm able to maintain the integrity of my position, the more I'm able to better express that force and wattage output, and boy, that's, that's the name of the game. And it's easy in the cycling language to sort of forget that cycling is still a positional skill because I'm supported by feet and the handlebars and the, right, and the foot pedals, and you get the idea. The whole thing. So I, I, I'm sure the cyclists have come to you before and said, like, I have IT band syndrome. No, I've never heard that. Does that happen? <laughs> cyclists even have IT bands? Is that, I guess, do you see that being like a red herring a lot of the time for well, it, athletes? There's an old... Um, uh, master body worker. She was the inventor of rolfing. Some people may have heard of rolfing. It's a structural integration, fascial based soft tissue therapy. And Ida Rolf said, where the rats get in is not where they chew. Hmm. So if you have some kink in your linkage, right, at some point, you know, that may not be the problem, but that's the failure spot. And so if your foot is turned out and you're at 100 RPM, let's just say, right? Is it, you know, somewhere between 90 and 100. And you're, you're taking that leg through 100 oscillations for three hours. And you're, you've got a big twist in the system. I mean, at some point, it's really important for us to understand that it's elegant mechanics. And that when I restore your, you know, like the Chinese weightlifters call this lever theory. And if you're, if you're leaking force and the arch is collapsing, your knees diving, and then you have a system that's just over stiffened. So, one of the easy ways, I think, to conceptualize some of the mechanisms for IT band dysfunction is that one is that I'm either in positions where my body's looking for stability. So if I can't create a stable foot through the, the cycle of the pedal stroke and do that through the ankle up through the hip because my hip knows how to manage all that force and transfer it from the, from the hip to the bike, then my body will create a stable platform for me. And it will do so by diving the knee in and the ankle will collapse. And so as I come around the turn on that pedal stroke, my body has found stability up against its own tissues, right? So if you stood up and slammed your knees together or just brought your knees together and stopped when they ran out of room, that's what you're doing potentially on the bike. You see a lot of knees hatcheting inward. This that's is right. Sort of thing, right. What you should be thinking of is, we call that a gimbal. So a gimbling is when you know a rocket is taking off and you see the, the rocket trying to balance underneath it, the jet. That gimbal trying to keep the system upright is basically force just leaking out. You're just dumping force. And the problem is we're so mechanically amazing and we can generate so much wattage that we don't perceive that as a real force dump and performance loss. And some of us don't have access to full ankle range of motion. So as I come around in my pedal stroke, 
I run out of ankle range of motion and my body's like, what am I gonna do with this extra leg? And so it dives in and by diving the knee in, I solve an ankle problem, potentially a hip range of motion problem. So we, what we call that is a sort of an open circuit. And so if you don't create a stable position and don't have access to the, to the physiology to get you there, your body will do it for you, right? And there are consequences. Well, there can be someday. Yeah. Yeah. And the consequence for me that I really care about is that you're losing. Right? You're not as fast as you could be. The second thing is when you're doing a lot of work, it's definitely potentially, potentially gets stiff. Look, we've just learned in terms of how uh, the connective tissue of the body um, adapts to a training stimulus is it doesn't build muscle first. It actually builds connective tissue first. That's the first order of business. So your body is like, whoa, I don't know what we just did, but let's make the whole system stronger. And we're going to do that by creating a better fascial connective tissue framework. So you can see that you can get really stiff really fast because that's the first order of business, right? So maintaining how your tissues are sliding over one another, we basically like to say that your tissues should be like warm silk sliding over steel springs. And most of us, our quadriceps, particularly the rectus femoris, the long quadricep that crosses the knee and the hip is like grilled cheese with spikes going in it, right? I have issues with that. Yeah, we, have, we all do. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and the longer you've been in this flex position generating force, the stiff potential you can be. And, you know... Do you think you're going to stretch beef jerky again? No. So what we have is an overtension system, maybe driving me into an inefficiency, right? This open torque system or open, open circuit system where I'm compensating. And now I have a recipe for a tissue finally being, raising its hand and saying, hey, something's got to change. And that's where like the pain becomes so severe that you can't carry out that activity. You become injured. Right? That's right. That's, that's right. That's, and that's, and that's that threshold. I can't bike today because it's killing me. Right. And then, and at that point, that's when you, you know, and, and I should say a lot of the time, that's when people seek out some sort of help. That's right. right. And, you know, and I understand that. I, I think sometimes we're using our physios wrong. We're using our, our doctors certainly wrong. I mean, if you go see your physician, she has, what, six to eight minutes to pick up your chart, read your chart, make a diagnosis. And like, did she watch you cycle? How many of you guys have been to a doctor and a doctor's like, let me see you on the bike. Let me see your fit. Can I see, can I see your pictures of, like that never happens. How many times a physical therapist? I mean, rarely, right? Maybe you meet a physio genius who can help you, like you're in Boulder, St. Andy, right? Great. Yeah. But that's not the rest of us. So what we're trying to do is say, look, we think that if we're so sophisticated that we can manage power and training and wattage and food and sleep, and I can track it all and HRV, and whatever things I care about, why can't I care about my hip range of motion, my ankle range of motion too? And to the effect that if I don't have access to that, let's restore that to minimize compensation. I'm going to step backward a bit into, and by the way, we're going to have some time for questions here pretty soon as well. So then uh, anybody here in the audience can ask some questions. Uh, I want to step back to flexibility really quick because I see a lot of cyclists stretching before, but this is a super common question that we get. Should I stretch before or after my trainer road workouts? That's the thing. When should I incorporate that? Why does it seem to be a general consensus seems to be that like stretching beforehand is bad? Do you know why that is, or do you have any suggestions on, on how to? Well, let's use the word. That's a great question and very, very reasonable as people are getting interested. So let's give kudos for like, when do I do this? Yeah. Right. And that's a yeah. big deal. So the first piece of that is, do I have access to my range of motion? Yes or no? Yes or no? So if I'm going to go do some brutal climbing where I have to fold over or something or be in some time trial position, and I can't bring my knee to my chest, that's going to be a problem. So maybe I might spend a few minutes improving that shape or making it easy for me to have access to that shape. But that typically doesn't look like stretching. So, you know, doing the splits or like stretching my hamstrings, I feel tension there. Does that improve my position? Yes or no? Probably not. Okay. So the, should I do it beforehand? Well, originally we saw that, hey, if you were doing static stretching and it gets a bad rap, but if I just pull on something and I feel tight, is that improving the system? right? And chances are it, it's not, and more importantly for us, it's not getting your brain involved with it. So you, what you're hoping is one aspect of the tissue is going to change. And usually the duration is sufficiently short and I'm not warmed up and it just doesn't, I don't get what I want. And more importantly, my brain doesn't know what I've been doing, right? So the world center, for, has anyone heard of PNF, mm -hmm. proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation? It's a style of stretching, we'll put in quotation marks. But the world center for PNF is over here in Kaiser Vallejo. And the idea is to use your brain to change your ability to access your positions, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. Huh. So using the tension, the position, the strain sensors of your body to facilitate change in quality of movement. And so anytime you've ever done an isometric, gotten to the end range and done an isometric hold, 
that's a PNF style mobilization. And what you're doing is you're telling your brain, I need you to be able to generate force in this position. So the research is really clear that do some isometric or neuromuscular stretching beforehand, fine. Well, again, mobilization is probably the best word. Do I think you should lay on the ground and do a whole body foam rolling exercise beforehand? Probably not a good use of your time. Right? No one ever won a world championship by laying on the ground and rolling their IT bands. Yeah. Right? What you see is if you watch the best kids warm up, they spend a lot of time getting physiologically warm and watch what's happening with squats and, and lunges and kettlebell swings. And people are realizing that the best way to get ready is probably to do some, get off the bike and do some more dynamic motion take my body through some simple hip spin-ups. And on our site, we've got some hip, simple hip spin-up drills. It takes a couple minutes, and you'll see that you'll have more efficient access. What I think you should be able to do, though, is conjoin your stimulus the diag with, a, with the stimulus for adaptation, which is cycling, with the diagnostic tool, which means those are happening at the same time. So if I go out, and I'm like, man, my knee was a little stiff. Right afterwards, bam, that's the time to maybe work on my positions and mechanics or shapes. So I'm a huge fan of saying, let's get you prepped for cycling better than putting on your kit and jumping on your bike. I think we can do better than that. But afterwards, our basic rule is, hey, for every session you do, give me 10 or 15 minutes of positional restoration, soft tissue mobilization, soft tissue stimulation, whatever the words are that you want to do. Why? To, to help you facilitate and have a better out, outcome from that training stimulus. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense too, right? You've got to spend time undoing the work. That you and, and let me just, the caveat is if you've got something that feels tight and stiff, mm -hmm. smash it out for a couple minutes. And use a gun, Theragun, use a roller, use a lacrosse ball. Get, you know, localized, like something, oh, my hip's stiff today. Go jump on the ball for a few minutes and then go, go do your sport, yeah. right? And you'll see that every sport in the world, people are doing dynamic warm-ups. Why are cycling still, like, we're still taking, like, smoking cigarettes with <laughs> tires around her, you know, holding the cork in our mouth? I mean, come on. Like, we're, we've evolved past that. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cycling kind of stays behind. Um, I'm going to open it up now to any questions that we might have from the audience on anything, whether it be stretching, mobility, strength training, anything like that. I have a couple questions already loaded in, but please go ahead. Hey, Kelly. Uh, thanks for coming by. Um, so earlier you said that uh, you could uh, get me into the Olympics if I just got a kettlebell. Um, I'm going to take you up on that offer. Uh, what? I'm going to need to see your genetics, too. <laughs> kettlebell plus you know, genetics. You didn't tell, tell me there were caveats here. Uh, what, what weight of a kettlebell do you recommend? And um, follow-up question what resources do you recommend for finding exercises to do with said kettlebell? So the, the question again is, hey, if I was going to start with the kettlebell, what should I do? Um, my friends at Strong First have great, that's, you know, Pavel's group. He, was, he really brought the kettlebell training to America. And it's very simple. And, you know, what we can do is we have a chance to really slow movements down. You can squat with it. You can press it. You can do, I mean, Turkish get-ups with it. Just exposed. So if, if you started, if you're a, a person who uh, self-identified as is a good beginner, somewhere between a 25 and 35 pound kettlebell would be great. You know, hey, I've done a little training before. Get yourself a 44 or 53, you know? So you'll see we've moved out of the pood language of kettlebells, which is very confusing. It was an old Russian term, a pood, one pood, half pood, I know. So, uh, but, and, and then if you looked around, I would start with strong first first because they do such a good job of on-ramping people into good kettlebells good get and really simple routines. And 15 or 20 minutes of weighted movement skill would be enough three or four times a week. Like, you really do it. You're getting all your conditioning on the bike. Why do we need to do more conditioning with the weights? Like, do you understand what I'm saying? It's not a great use of my time. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's a good point that I see a lot of times people are, like, wondering how to combine things like CrossFit and something else they kind of pull on the same strings a lot of the time and they end up just putting themselves in a hole. And, you know, let's say that uh, you need a little input from the body, you know, externally. I mean, you can't hold two water bottles full of water and pretend like that's strength training. That's carrying my water bottles to my bike, right? That's not the same thing. You know what I mean? Strength training it, for some seconds. And it doesn't matter how many times I shake them, right? <laughs> it's, not, it's not strength training. Awesome. I think that'd be great. Yeah, it was 20 to 30. Unfortunately, you have a job, so get yourself two kettlebells, an aspirational kettlebell and a starter kettlebell. <laughs> and we also use a kettlebell a lot for, uh, for mobilization. 
because you can lay against the couch and smash out your quads. True fact, right? It's a good way. Handles good too. Handles good too. Yeah, yeah. Mateo, did you have a question? We're passing around a cube, by the way, for those that don't, uh, that are just. Listening. I'll throw it up there after so, you, so that people can see it. Um, <laughs> thanks for coming in. Long time listener, first time caller. Um, I had a question. So you, you mentioned flexibility versus mobility. What are the things someone who considers themselves flexible can do, like tests or self assessment on mobility so that we don't get to this point where it's too late and then we're all of a sudden we're doing all these weird things to fix ourselves? Yeah, well, I think if you have a good movement practice, and you're doing some soft tissue work afterwards, probably you're, you're hitting the box, right? And, um, you know, I think you really bring up a good question is, where are the benchmarks? Yeah, where's the line? Where are the lines? So there's this website and a few books that has uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of these benchmarks written out for you. And honestly, if you, if you went to our site today, um, you could, we have some simple self-assessments because that's what we want to do. We want to get the physical therapist, the exercise physiologist, the biomechanist out of the conversation, this conversation between you and your body. And so even just squatting down with your feet together is our a quick check, you know, and how do I, how much range of motion work do I need enough to maintain my positions? So I think you can still be an elite athlete and still have access to your full physiology. And a good example of that Stephen Hyde, wonderful, great strength athlete. Um, also, Kate Courtney right now, if you go on her, you know, Kate Plus Fade and watch how she's training, you're going to see, wow, she's training like an athlete. Like, she's really an extraordinary athlete, but has access to all of her positions and shapes. And so, that, you know, if you're engaged in a full movement practice, you're probably hitting some of these shapes, right? But some of the tests, you know, like, can you, can you hold your arms straight up over your head without your elbows flaring and neck doing the weird things, the banana backing, you know, and can you take 10 breaths in that position? If you can't, you don't have full access to your shoulder range, for example. We think that's important. And, and you have time to fix it, right? Good question. I, I remember an example of this uh, when I was trying to solve the knee issue and trying to find someone to blame for the knee issue. It's probably a better, better thing to say. Um, when I was going through that whole process, I remember the, the PT, um, I was up in Bend working with Jada Shari, he basically just lifted my, I was on my stomach and he lifted my knee to 90 degrees and in 90 degrees, my hips started lifting off the ground. Just 90 degrees. Almost like we talked about this. Yeah. And, yeah. And, that, and, and here's the deal. If no one ever said it was important, you didn't know it was important. Mm -hmm. Now you do. And that's what's gorgeous about this podcast and people are now becoming more sophisticated, more interested and also owning more, right? But I can't blame a generation of athletes who are like told stretching is bad or, or they tried stretching and it didn't make them faster or didn't help their pain. So we have, you know, we really believe strongly in the fact that people are so smart that they stop doing what doesn't work. Right. I mean, that, that seems crazy, but if people aren't doing something, it's because it probably didn't work. And that may be user error, but oftentimes it, it wasn't effective or a good use of your time. And if you give athletes a set of tools that improves their range, they are obsessed because they translate that right to, to force and wattage. And that's, that's what we have to do is we have to make it easier for people to understand. So, for example, on our site where we love cycling and we have indoor cycling programs and programs with playlists. So we give you a couple ideas, five or ten minutes of working on your position beforehand. And then afterwards, I do three, you know, two or three follow-along videos of you being able to just grab some equipment, follow along, work on your shapes afterwards. And then the next time you come back, it's a brand new playlist. So what we're trying to do is make it easier and eventually you'll get the, get the game and be able to totally manage it yourself. I have a question actually that was submitted today from Steve and he actually says that he travels a bunch. I'll, I'll summarize, but basically travels a bunch for work, always has a bike with him, always gets to be able to ride when he's traveling for work. But he wants to know if there's like a, a quick routine that you would go through of just like, basically sitting in car and then going to movement before you get on the bike? You know, what I would say is without describing it, yes. You know, and what I like to do is I like to remove that stuff from my training. Because if my, tr you know, I have a couple kids, a couple businesses, and when it's time to train, I want to be able to go. So I sort of obsess about my positions and I noodle on it a little bit during the day. So for example, I often work while sitting on the ground. This young lady in front was sitting cross-legged in a chair right? Working on, you were sitting cross-legged earlier. Yes. Which is a wonderful way to open up your hips before you ride, right? This young lady over here is at a standing desk all day long and fidgeting. Foot is up, working on her feet in a position where she's always having a chance to move more. So 
how can I get more movement in the day? And even if, you know, the first thing you did in the morning was sun salutation, Google sun salutation, it's only like 2,000 years old, I'm sure there's an old video about it. If you did sun salutation in the morning and then rode it in lunch, your mind would be blown. You'd be like, this is amazing. I'm like, yeah, it's like sun salutation works because someone figured it out like 2,000 years ago. That if you took your body to this range of motion, practice breathing, you'd be a kick-ass athlete. Imagine right? that, right? So the key here is, again, you know, I have, we have some things that feel and smell a little more modern but really is about trying to just at least take my joints and tissues through some ranges so that it's easier for me to warm up. So it doesn't take me 45 minutes before I start to feel good on the bike. Cause that's, that's not a good use of time. Awesome. Another question. Yeah. Um, thanks for all your content. The only reason I get squat to the ground is from watching your videos. Um, nice. Some are these plants actually, but, this you're, whole but thing you're so is, tall. It should be impossible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> related to maybe related to Steve's scenario there. We, we spent a lot of days sitting um, and you're kind of bent over on a bike. I, I find that, I'm sure a lot of people find that I have tight hip flexors all the time. Yeah. Any, how, is it mostly strengthening and mobility or is, is there strength training specifically for that that you recommend or how do you recommend kind of avoiding the hip tension? A lot of times we have said to people that this is a strength issue, right? You need to get stronger. And I'm like, really? Like, I don't know. You ever seen, uh, you know, some of the best cyclists climb in the Tour de France? How strong are they? Strong enough to climb really fast in the Tour de France. So, you know, again, the goal is how, you know, I carry these quads around and they're not great. They're great when we're on the trainer together for our one minute short pieces, but uh, afterwards I have to carry them up the hill. So I'm definitely too strong to be a good cyclist, right? But I like to lift and the other sports I'm in. So the real question is, do you have access to this range of motion or not? And, and if do you know the couch stretch, Couch stretch is when you put your knee in the corner up against the wall and you have to bring yourself up into a high kneeling position. If you can't couch stretch, you don't have access to the shape. So, you know, it may be that you're stiff, but if I, my sport was, um, you know, for example, cycling, and I was spending the rest of my day in a seated position, I would maybe think that, you know, the first thing I would do is, hey, can I move more? And, you know, at Strava, you guys actually have really enlightened a leadership because everyone has a standing desk. Right? So we're giving people movement options. So sitting isn't bad, standing isn't better. Standing gives me more opportunity to move and fidget during the day. And when I, you know, right now I'm perching, right? I'm, this is still considered standing. So I can be moving more dynamically, getting my hip in some shapes. And as I was about to ride home and Strava that, you know, I guarantee you that the rest of the day would look like a little bit more hip extension trying to get ready as I was answering those final emails. <laughs> trying to prep myself, you know, and I would, I would think, God, there's some things I must be able to do to get my hips ready. And I could be doing all that at work. And if only someone wrote a book on that, imagine that a few years ago, <laughs> about not wasting your time. Deskbound is the book. Though. And that's what we want to do. Yeah. And, and uh, giving light to the fact that people actually have really condensed, difficult lives. Like if you came with me on a, on a fantasy bike camp and I, we rolled in the morning and did yoga and I, fed you the organic, you know, and then we stretched and we swam, we rode, you'd feel great. Yeah. And you went back to your life and you're like, whoa, this doesn't work at all. So when am I going to do that? So what I want my athletes to do is really respect their training time. And then on the borders and the margins, like don't do your soft tissue work today, but right before you go to bed, we found that we had the best adherence to people being able to do their soft tissue work just for right the last 15 minutes before they went to the bedroom. Because you're on the internet, you're watching TV, there's nothing is happening. But what we found is that our adherence went through the roof, and then that wasn't one more thing you were trying to cram in. So how much movement can I get in during the day, right? And if I have permission to move more at my work, that makes me more likely to have access to my physiology. A little soft tissue at work at night, you're golden. Awesome. Any other questions through here? I have one. Hit me. Uh, in your... In your research that you did, like you said, on, on trying to basically, when you're through your doctorate, trying to decide what stops people from sticking to the plan, that's fascinating to me because we see, honestly, mm -hmm. probably the biggest differentiator between, uh, and, and for this is nerdy for cyclists, but basically between a rider that can crack four watts per kilogram and go above that versus riders below that is consistency. So is there one thing that you learn from that that you feel like you would want to share with cyclists knowing the fact that consistency is so important? Like what does stop them or what is something they can do? Uh, we have this friend named Jocko Willick, you know, he's an incredible speaker and leader. And he's like, discipline is freedom. And when I hear discipline, I'm like, yeah, it doesn't resonate with me, but behavior <laughs> and consistency, right? Habit makes that. So 
the more steps between you and taking an action, the less likely you do the action. So if you want to roll out a little bit more as generally, because you think that's going to be better for you, and you put the roller next to the couch, you'll be like, oh, it's right there, right? And there are a lot of examples of this in Disneyland having the right trash can, the right distance away. Like you, everyone can always see a trash can so they don't throw the litter down. So what we want to do is move the action closer so there's less things to do. So, you know, lay everything out the night before. Get rid of all the resistance that might keep you from doing what you need to do. And I think we're through tracking now. Tracking is not the problem. We're, we're getting tracking. And more importantly, tracking is great because it brings consciousness. But the magic of Strava and even Trainer Road is that I can be in a tribe. I'm in a community, and that's the magic. Everything else, is it's cool. But the fact that I can talk, compare, see what's going on, human beings are the most important. So when I create a little cabal around a behavior, that makes a difference. We roll right back to my house, and we both roll out. And so really, ultimately, the goal is to reduce the number of steps between you and a behavior. If you don't eat like to eat, but know you should eat before a ride in the morning, make it super easy that you're going to just grab something and you don't, you just have to trip over it. Right. And so ultimately that's what we found is the best behavior modification is removing all of the things, you know, it is from my couch to my, you know, watt bikes is like 30 feet. So if I need to get it in something early, shook open the door, I'm on my watt bike and I don't have to drive somewhere to get it. If I want to train more and strength train more, have a kettlebell in the kitchen. You know, if I have to go to the gym after a long day of work and riding, not going to happen. In other words, we should live in our chamois 24-7. Always be wearing our bike shoes. Obviously. This is awesome. Thank you so much, Kelly. Oh, this such a pleasure. Great. I'm such a fan of you guys. Well, and likewise, this has been uh, fantastic. If people want to find out more about you, they can go to The Ready State. We're right? TheReadyState.com. And you can find books. You can find everything, training programs, all that stuff on there. And just like a new cyclist coming in, we onboard you slowly. You get 14 days, you get a little bit of like, we're going to do a little thing. You don't need equipment. Here's how they use this. We'll, we'll on-ramp you because the first time you drop in, it can feel a little overwhelming. And our old site felt a little bit like the Library of Alexandria. <laughs> we never set out to make 4,000 videos about how your body works. So we'd be like, come over to the site. And people would open the doors and freak out. And yeah, shut yeah. the doors. <laughs> you know, and now it's a little bit more user-friendly. And we've taken what we've learned over the last, you know, 12 years and really tried to synthesize it into really simple actionable awesome so people can check that out if you have questions for kelly we can actually we can probably get them still to him if you're listening to this just go to trainerroad.com slash podcast we can submit them there we'll make sure they go that way to kelly. and i have, i'm I have a house in Truckee, and you're in reno so we need to go riding the same yeah exactly maybe we can go see how fast levi still climbs <sighs> <laughs> hate that guy he's fast alright thanks everybody here at Strava too thank you so much uh, for joining us now. thank you guys